So he has um, a PhD, and he um, has recently, well, he formed a group of airline investigators who have looked at some of the data, and uh, this is all publicly available data, but I'll let Tom uh, present things. Okay, so this is about, this is the plane right there. They reconstructed it in uh, Calverton, Long Island. It blew up off the coast of Long Island in midair. Um, Professor Yerg is right, there were many accounts of a, an object streaking up. This crashed, well, I'll show you, off the coast of Long Island. And uh, there were many, um, uh, hundreds, so they were on the beaches. It was 8.30 at night, the sun had just set. What this presentation isn't going to be about eyewitnesses. There will be one eyewitness at the end that's just going to speak. He was an Air National Guard pilot, he was in Vietnam. He has some, actually some um, experience in identifying the difference between a detonation and, de and a deflagration as uh, Professor Eager was talking about. And we'll hear from him for about a two minute period, but that's at the end. This is all about radar evidence. What does the radar evidence show? The radar evidence isn't a human being. It's, it's data, um, you can rely on it. It's not worried about a promotion, not worried about anything. And then we're just gonna talk about today, almost uh, solely on the radar evidence. And the CIA was the first um, agency to discuss the radar evidence, and they used it to help explain what the eyewitnesses really actually saw. And like I said before, this is off the coast of Long Island. Everyone can recognize where Long Island here on the map? Okay, so I'll just show you. This is uh, New York City around here. This is the Hamptons. Uh, this is Montauk. This is Connecticut over here. Okay, so the plane was coming out of JFK and was about 10, 11 minutes into its flight. And almost the perfect position to be at if you want to see it crash from the beach. It's about 10, 8 miles out. And if you're sitting on the beach, you have to be looking that way. What the witnesses say anyway is they saw something go up, and the, whatever they saw went up, it exploded, and this huge ball of fire came down. That's what they said. So the, the FBI went and immediately interviewed these people. Some of them made it on the news. Uh, you guys are all too young for that. But um, I was a 26-year-old grad student when the time of the crash in, in Tallahassee, as we were talking about. And, um, you hear in the back of your head, oh, people saw a streak of light. You remember that, Professor Eager? People heard a streak of light. Or, or people saw a streak of light, and it was in the news. But then it quickly died down. The FBI took over, and uh, you didn't hear much about it. But a year and a half after the crash, um, the CIA came on TV. The following program was produced by the Central Intelligence Agency. Using these eyewitness reports and radar tracking data, CIA analysts were able to reconstruct the approximate path of Flight 800 from the instant its recordings ended until it struck the water. The following sequence of events is based on that analysis. Just after the aircraft exploded, it pitched up abruptly and climbed several thousand feet from its last recorded altitude of about 13,800 feet to a maximum altitude of about 17,000 feet. Shortly after Flight 800 reached the peak of its ascent, about 20 seconds after it exploded, a fireball erupted from the aircraft. Sounds plausible. Actually, it is possible. Um, what do you have going uh, 385 knots? You have kinetic energy. It's possible. Uh, if they're in a vacuum, they could have climbed up to 6,000 feet. Uh, they weren't in a vacuum. Uh, when that front section came off, it was probably the worst aerodynamic shape you could possibly have. And there's a lot of drag, but you could reach, they've calculated a maximum of 30,000 feet. And that's what that video showed, a 3,000 foot climb. And they said it was based on the radar data. So we'll just uh, check <coughs> their work. This is where Flight Hunter is traveling. Long Island's here. Uh, the CIA simulation. The, the, what the NTSB did was they, this is called a longitude motion only simulation where the CIA said, in, well, in order to maximize the climb, you can't bank, you can't turn. You want all your lift going upward. So you're flying along and um, the front section comes off. To maximize the climb, you're going to just go up and up and up and up. That's called a longitudinal motion only. If you start banking in any direction, a lot of the forces will be used to turn rather than climb. And so 
The, the CIA didn't do that at all. And in fact, because of that, they didn't follow the radar tracking. Uh, so the plane lost electrical power approximately here. And you can immediately see a left bank. This is the actual data. This is what the plane actually did. And we're talking about half mile, quarter mile, sharp bank left turn immediately. And uh, the NTSB didn't consider that, or the, uh, the, C the CIA didn't consider that. In fact, their data, they did their animation despite the radar evidence, not, uh, it, it, the radar evidence actually does not support what they did. So what the NTSB did was they, they fixed it for them. They said, well, let's put a bank in. But they didn't just put a bank in and say, let's put a bank in and see what happens. They put a bank in. Then they turn a right, they, because they had to turn back. You can't just keep banking. If you turn, keep banking, you're going to go down. They put a bank in, and in the simulation, the person who did the simulation steered it back to the right so it would climb. And that's how they made the climb. They wanted that. They needed a climb. They needed a climb because everyone on the beaches saw something go up. And so what did that give them? Well, it didn't go to 17,000 feet like the CAA said, but you're up to 15,000 feet. Now, it doesn't look like something come off the surface, but they can say to the public, Yes, it's physically possible for the plane to have climbed. So you have a 15,000 foot climb. And uh, to most in the public and the media, except a physics grad student like me who looks at the data a little more closely, that's the same data. This is now position versus time. Anyone understand what's happening here? The, re the red line is a simulation. That's the simulation showing the climb. Anyone know what's happening? And a position versus time plot, what the slope is. Sorry, what time are you That's the radar data. Okay. That's where it sees the big thing in the sky. There's lots of small things too, but that's the big, the big hole, right? Well, yes. Uh, the plane itself is the best, most aerodynamically shaped thing out there. Anything that falls off gets sucked behind it. So it's the thing that's moving forward. So the fastest thing in the air in the plane, which is a big mess of radar data, but thing in the front is what these, these uh, symbols track. And that's actually tracking of the plane when its nose fell off it. They showed it, it's still going. And what you're seeing here is a position versus time plot. And it's no longer matching the data. And like I said, who knows what uh, the slope is in a position versus time plot. Exactly. Why would it slow down? There's no thrust or little thrust. And? It's not actively being controlled. It's climbing. Conservation of energy. Where are you, you going to climb? You don't have thrust to climb like a missile. <laughs> you, all you have is kinetic energy. So what do you, what's going to happen? You, you do a simulation, which you're going to use the laws of physics in your simulation, I presume, which is what they did. Thankfully, <laughs> they weren't like the CIA and just showed something. They actually, the NTSB, did a simulation and it was based on the laws of physics. They had this big slowdown. And so you now see that the plane Oh, okay, there, there's the conservation of energy. Everyone knows this. This is kind of the opposite. You drop a ball from, say, 100 feet up, you know, you're going to get your velocity is going to be in a vacuum anyway. It's going to be directly, they're actually uh, a square of uh, the change in uh, altitude, right? That, that's the equal. That's conservation of energy. You well know that. So when the plane's going up, it's the opposite is going to happen. It's going to go up in a gravitational field, it's going to slow down. That's what you saw. And so you can rudimentarily do a rudimentary check on what's happening here. And that was the east-west position versus time. This was going north-northeast. But most of it was going east. So the eastern component of its velocity um, is this, for the first 12 seconds, is this first uh, line here. And you see, this is the first 12 seconds. There was no change in airspeed at all. In fact, it appeared to perhaps increase in velocity. So what was happening was it was banking left and maybe accelerating. <laughs> it got faster. If not, stayed the same. It was not climbing. It did not climb. <laughs> but the NTSB's radar data shows it, it, or the NTSB's simulation, which is here, you're seeing this line here, that's going about half the speed of what the plane was actually doing. Because they had to show the climb. They had to. They had to. If you're going to say there was nothing that climbed in the sky from the surface of the ocean, then what did? They only had one thing left. It was the plane. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there. I'm a grad student in physics watching this going, and I got, then ended up, ended up getting the radar data myself because I had to check. So anyway, that's, that's beyond the point. But anyway, this, this, is actually, this isn't me. This is the NTSB plot here. What I did was I added these straight lines and I, I added this box here. Everything else is NTSB. I did two straight lines 
And uh, I calculated, you know, linear. You know, it's rise over run, remember that? And that's speed, right? Okay. We're all scientists here. I'm very happy to give this presentation in front of all of you. Because, you know, when I say rise versus one in a press conference, the media is just, ah, uh, and they want to walk out of the room. Anyway, so, so there's the actual location of the plane. So remember that nice plot the NTSB did that fits the data? Isn't that great? Well, they're about a half mile, quarter mile behind where the airplane actually was. And that's because the plane didn't climb. It was going much faster because it didn't have to climb. It wasn't climbing. Okay. And there was also, on radar, something that should not have been there. I'll show you a bit, a bit closer. Okay, this is the plane itself. Now this is now a position plot. This is the plane flying with electrical power. The red line signifies it has electrical power. Immediately here, there was an event. Electrical power goes out, no more red line. This should not have been here. In the NTSB official scenario, what you have is a deflagration in the tank. The plane is going along, it has a deflagration, the weakest wall is the front wall. The front wall fails, and it creates a hole in the belly of the plane. This is all what the NTSB says. And, and the wreckage is sucked out, sucked out, sucked out. There is nothing shot to the left, upward, right. If anything, there is wreckage, maybe shot a little bit in velocity downward. But that's down a hole in the belly of the plane, it gets sucked out behind it. There should be nothing a half a mile south, at all. And this is 8.5 seconds after the initial loss of electrical power. Something goes a half a mile. How's that possible in 8.5 seconds? It can't. There's, a, there's only one possibility, either a high velocity projectile or a detonation, not the deflagration of the tank. The deflagration of the tank was forward, wasn't moving, it was going the wrong direction, it was the wrong speed. Okay? And there it is here. This is about a half a mile south of where it lost electrical power. So this is, this is actually raw data, and this isn't just one radar site. This is the ISLIP radar site in MacArthur ISLIP Airport, what you're showing here. You also had a White Plains. This is off in New York, New York City, or not New York City, but off, off in Long Island. You had White Plains, you had JFK, you have these, these radar sites showing the same thing, wreckage where it should not have been. Did the CIA report indicate which radars were examined? <laughs> no. Okay. That, that, what, that, what you, you just heard. They also said they uh, used satellite data, too. And were you ever able to find the guy at the CIA that done the analysis? Yes. Part? He won't return my call. Yeah. Uh, Randy Taus. Okay, so here we go. Let's give them the best case scenario. Let's create a vacuum instead of uh, 13,000 feet air pressure. Uh, pretend it's in outer space. You have a deflagration wavefront. Sandia Labs did the, uh, did the they have a two, this is a 25 PSI overpressure. And so what they did in the Sandia National Labs was they did a, um, a simulation to show the wavefront velocity. I said, I asked the guy, I said, what was the maximum wavefront velocity you could get? He said, oh, 100 meters per second. Okay, the plane was going 200 meters per second. <laughs> Even if the wreckage was shot towards where, this is where the radar, this is where the wreckage actually showed up on radar. Even if the plane didn't, the, it, the well didn't fall forward, it fold opposite what the NTSB said, and, they, and there was a vacuum, you couldn't get wreckage where it was. It's impossible. By the way, Sandia has the best software for explosives in the world because they simulate the nuclear weapons. Okay. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Okay, so, like I said before, uh, debris is going to suck behind the plane. That's the official theory. And the NTSB, it took us a while, but one of my colleagues sued them in court, got their data. We got their trajectory data. This is actually something they publish. But they never published the actual tabular format where we could actually show it in a video, uh, actually what the wreckage did. But like I said, it should be like a tail behind the plane. And this right here is the plane, right? Lose electrical power here. If you saw it, you're going to see a simulation shortly. Actually, an animation based on actual trajectory data. But it's going to land here. Nothing is here, if you notice. In the official theory, nothing can be there. Um, it was physically impossible for anything to get there. and so. They say nothing was there. Nothing was recovered there. Nothing went there. So all the debris that was recovered is here. So the NTSB trajectory data, which we got, I think we all know what that formula is. That's what happens when you throw a napkin out of your car window or a rock or anything. It's going to follow the laws of physics, and you have uh, the drag and the uh, velocity and the 
cross-sectional uh, surface area and the, and the density of air. And you have this uh, constant in the front. And that's going to be the force on the object. And that's what they use to make their simulations. And I'll play those. Now, basically, we got the NTSB data. And I'm going to show you a, uh, an animation showing that data sped up, just so you can see. OK, there's the tail I was telling you about. That's the official theory. You're looking at it. That's their data. That's what happened. There was nothing that went left, nothing that went south. Nothing could have. This is, a, this is the NTSB trajectory data of the debris that came out of the airplane soon after it uh, lost electrical power. Then we're going to show the next one you'll see is going to be same thing, but overlaid with the radar evidence. What you're seeing there is impossible if you if you're going to have the official theory as your as your as as your explanation. Oh, and this is the uh, this is simulated uh, a detonation with a high speed debris or, or the breakup of high speed object. And you see that fits the data quite nicely. So I want you guys to to see something here. You know, it, the next part of the presentation is going to say, okay, well. This is data, how accurate is the data? And we want to make sure that this isn't some kind of uh, artifact of uh, maybe a um, discontinuity in the data or perhaps some kind of uh, error, error analysis that, that was done incorrectly. Go to see both of them again. This is no radar data. This is just trajectory data. This is, you're looking at the official scenario of what happened, or what, the, what the government says happened. This is what the FAA radar data shows what happened, overlaid with the government's data. And that's where we simulated some high speed debris using the, actually the NTSB's own trajectory uh, software, but using very high velocities in, in the proper direction. As an it, and it, Oh, this one? Okay, I'll, I'll pause it here. Okay, so just be aware, you know, you're seeing data here um, south of the flight path. That's significant because it'll be, this isn't about witnesses, but we will have one eyewitness who is a rescue pilot in Vietnam to explain a trajectory that may fit the data you're seeing. <clears throat> okay, so I think we pause the video after this. And I mean, you can just look at it, right? A lot of data well south of where it should have been. And now the, the analysis comes in. It's actually quite simple. <laughs> I mean, well, you'll see. Well, just, I'm not gonna, uh, uh, just, you'll just see. I'm just going to show you what comes next and let you guys decide for yourselves. So that's the formula the NTSB relied upon. OK, now let's look at the data analysis part. <clears throat> you all took statistics. I'm sure you guys know how to do standard deviation calculations. Well, look how nice that data is. What you're seeing here is, this is a Navy P-3 Orion aircraft, which happened to be, by coincidence, very close to the crash when it occurred. And this is the radar tracking, the same radar data set that you saw the high speed debris just now. This is the same data, but it's tracking an aircraft. And actually, the good thing about it is it didn't have its transponder on, and that's, because, that's why it was in this data set. If it had its transponder on, a different radar would have picked it up. It would have been beeping. It would have been called a secondary radar. Remember, you're asking primary radar, what's that? Primary radar is the skin reflection. You shine a light, it bounces off, and you measure it. If something doesn't have a transponder, that's the only thing that gets recorded. If it has a transponder, it hits the plane, makes a little beep, I'm at this altitude, and this is who I am, flight 800, or whatever your code is. And then uh, you'd be in, a, he'd be in a different data set. But luckily, this, this particular plane did not have its transponder operating. And so he's on the same data set as the high-speed debris. And you can see how this is a uh, linear fit, I believe, a linear fit to his flight path, and you can see it looks like there's not much, uh, not much error. What is the error? It's, it's not widely, it's not off by a half mile. You know, it's not a half mile error. But let's, we can calculate that. So basically what MIT did at Lincoln Laboratory a while back was they studied secondary data. This is actually a really cool plot. I love this plot. This is, um, this is secondary data, okay? Secondary radar data, but same exact radar. 
And what they're showing here is, what is your azimuth error? Meaning, when the radar is going around, you know, how much you off in your compass angle where, with, where the plane actually is. And flight, flight 800 was about 22 miles away from the radar data, or ra the radar site, and around, is that 14,000 feet approximately. So in this blue area. Okay, that's where it was. So blue, what's that? Um, where are we here? It's actually 0 0.06. It's very, I don't know if you guys can see that. That's 0 0.06 here. This is a 0 0.1 here, 0 0.12, see that? So you're, you're at 0 0.06 degree error. And they did that. And so what I did was I looked at the secondary data set from the crash and got the exact, well, I think I got 0 0.06, yeah. So I matched it up. I'm like, okay, I must be doing it right. So I, I did the same analysis that, that Lincoln Laboratory did. Then I said, okay, let's apply that same analysis to the primary radar data set. And uh, this is what I got. So here's, here's the error in the north-south direction. Well, here's the error. The north-south error is a combination of your azimuth error and your range error. So if you see, the, pretend the radar site's way up here, which it was, right? And the radar sweep is going by. So this is your azimuth error, right? And your range error is how far away you are from the airport. You know, what is that error? And that is basically distance from, distance back. So this dimension of the square is range error. This dimension of the square is azimuth error. And the combination of those two will give you the error in your north-south uh, direction. And that was that debris was heading north-south direction. So the error is 0 0.05 nautical miles. So here we go. Here is the debris coming here in 8.5 seconds. It's well within, there's no way that this is just a, 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 uh, an artifact of error. That this, this is actually debris. It was here, there's no doubt about it, and there was a lot of it. Well, you guys all know this, but um, <clears throat> sigma is standard deviation. How many standard deviations was this debris away from where it should have been? And, what, and is that significant? Yes, I'll answer my own question. When people in, <laughs> if, you, if you're okay with it, the people over in, uh, where were they, Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, or Hadron, they announced the discovery of the Higgs boson with five sigma certainty. Once you get five sigma certainty, you know it exists. Well, this data is like eight sigma certainty. <laughs> or eight sigma sure that the NTP theory is wrong. With one piece of data, it's like 50 data points. 50 data points <laughs> with eight sigma certainty, that record was there. And there it is. Okay, so this is all the data that you guys saw in the animation. Here's some over here. And you see these little pieces here? Well, this was the wind direction. And uh, these are significant too. I mean, it's definitely a minute or two after the crash, but it shows that this debris was here about a minute ago. So all this d data here confirms this event here. And so, what did we do? In 2013, we actually did a documentary. And we had actually, like uh, Professor Eager said, there were actually whistleblowers from within the NTSB investigation. At the time, these guys were like, you know, this is ridiculous. You know, some of them were scientists. And imagine, imagine being, seeing this, like, like me, I was a grad student looking on the outside going, this is ridiculous over here. <laughs> these guys are inside saying the same thing. They're barred from speaking. You, you talk and you're in TWA, you're out of the investigation. You can't talk to the public. You're an employee of the NTSB? You wanna talk? You're fired. It's a hierarchy. It's like the military. You'd be surprised. These guys do not have peer review. <laughs> I think the, they can also lose their pensions. Yes, right. That's why Hank Hughes, our documentary came out in 2013. I think he retired a couple years earlier. It took us a few years to do the documentary. He, he said, I'm not going to talk till I retire. When he retired, we did our documentary. And once he, he came on board, we had five other guys join us. And uh, I don't know, I'm kind of getting beside the point, but this is just what happened with the documentary. Who was in our documentary? insiders that wanted to talk and they couldn't. So these guys filed a petition with the NTSB saying we had to change the probable cause determination of the crash because we have all this debris showing that a high velocity event occurred. This was not a deflagration. This was a detonation. And in fact, it confirms what the witnesses said, which we'll see one of them later. And the NTSB wrote back. Actually, we were in the news too. We were in CNN. We were everywhere. It really hit the news. You guys, I don't know if you remember this. In 2013, ever remember hearing about this crash in 2013 time period at all? At all? No? Okay, see, didn't, didn't make that big a splash. But we were in the news, and the NTSB had to respond. And so they did. 
They said, oh, could have been a discontinuity. What's a discontinuity? Systematic error. Systematic error, I mean, if it's, if it's a discontinuity, that means all the data should be shifted by the same amount. Okay, I did that. Let's, let's try it. I shifted all the primary data after it lost selective power northward to say, okay, it was part of the plane. Well, that's, that's not going to work. Then the plane's going to crash a half mile north of where they recovered it. So it's not a discontinuity. And they also, also what did they say? A couple other things. They said, oh, we, we, we studied this. We, we showed wreckage go, uh, going at high speed. And uh, no, they didn't. The, the, the highest speed wreckage they showed was over 8.5 seconds, an average speed of 34 knots. That's their high speed. Okay? And it was going the wrong direction. There was no wreckage. <laughs> As you saw, you saw their data. There was no wreckage over there. Supersonic is about 600 knots. Yes, yeah. right. But I'm saying, I'm just giving it a but average over 8.5 seconds, right. I think that initial speed for that 35 knot calculation was 300 knots. So they never did a supersonic anything. But for the supersonic, what we did, the, 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 the simulation that you saw with the debris going down, we, we started that at Mach 4, and that fit the data best. The start, initial speed, super, uh, Mach 4, average speed over 8.5 seconds, uh, about 160 knots. So there's this way. I showed you this before, right? Eight sipping uncertainty. You just count up. You get your standard deviation. You start counting up. It's 0 0.05 miles. It's about a half mile away. You've got 10 sigma by the time you get to the flight path. You give them wind, you say eight or nine sigma. If you're eight or nine sigma certain that this official scenario does not account for that debris. Okay, this is, this is what you guys are waiting for. Okay, there were witnesses. We spoke about them. I didn't want this to be about witnesses. I wanted this to be about data. But this particular witness was a rescue pilot in Vietnam. He saw detonations and he saw deflagrations. Let's see. So he's in, the, he's in a Black Hawk helicopter at the time. He's doing a night air refueling mission. And he's doing landings because it wasn't that dark out yet. Let's do some landings first. He did one landing, went around again, and was coming in for another landing. He is right over the numbers, he said. And then the, uh, and the uh, air traffic control at Gabreski Field um, said, hey, there's a Cessna. This is an airport the National Guard shares with the, with the public. And so you have private planes. There's a Cessna coming into the pattern. He said, there's a Cessna coming in. And whenever that happens, I'm a pilot. You want to have eye contact. Where is this thing? And they, they got cleared. They, didn't, they cleared him for something called a write down when he was coming around the airport like this. This is, this is the runway 24, OK? This is, and I extended it because he's coming down runway 24. I wanted to give you his viewpoint. That's the black line. So he's looking down the black line, OK? But when you're cleared for a write down, when you're either airplane coming like this, and this is your write down one, meaning you're going downwind, and the airport's on your right. So they cleared for a write down when it's a Cessna. And, uh, and that's all I'm going to do to set it up because he's, oh, then, he, then he'll tell you the rest. So let's just hear what he says after that. The so air traffic control just called him and said, there's a Cessna. And we'll let him. Is that the north shore of Long Island? I'm sorry, that's the south shore. I flipped it upside down because I want to give his perspective. So you're looking south here, okay, guys? Oh, and by the way, I'll just show you what this is, too, beforehand. Um, if this is the right one, yeah. Like I said, there were hundreds of eyewitnesses, and you can triangulate. You can actually, some of them drew pictures of this thing coming off the ocean, doing this and this, and most of them said it took a, a left, not most of them, but there was a statistical significant, significantly a amount of witnesses that saw a left turn right beforehand. And so you get a trajectory of not only up, but up, out, left explosion. And so this is the approximate path of what other witnesses described. And then with, having said that, I will play Major Meyer. So I immediately leaned forward, and uh, I was wearing the typical military helmet with night vision goggles on the front for the air refueling mission. And the goggles were up, and so I had to press the goggles right against the windscreen in order to get the best view. And I scanned the, uh, the horizon and the area in front of me looking for a Cessna. Uh, at that moment, I saw a streak of light across the sky from my left center to my further left. It uh, appeared to me to be about 20 degrees above the horizon. It was moving very rapidly. Um, I observed it for about three to five seconds and uh, then it, uh, it momentarily disappeared. Um, just about a second after it disappeared, I saw an explosion. 
and the explosion was on the trajectory of the streak of light I had been following, which appeared to me to be military ordnance. It, uh, it had a sort of reddish yellow uh, color that I'd seen many, many times before, more times than I care to remember. Now, I know the difference between an ordnance explosion and a petrochemical because flying over North Vietnam, making rescues, I very often saw us drop ordnance. I saw us drop ordnance on oil depots, and I could see the, ord the ordnance explode, and I could see the oil depot explode, and uh, I am able to distinguish by color the difference. There's also a difference in speed. An ordnance explosion, uh, one never sees it develop. Uh, I use the term, now you don't see it, now you do. An ordnance explosion just suddenly appears, whereas a petrochemical explosion grows, and you can actually see the growth of the explosion. <clears throat> that's Major Meyer, and that's uh, pretty much all I'm going to, I can take questions now, if you're interested. I would point out that a deflagration explosion goes at about a meter per second, okay? Uh, oh. Maximum velocity. Uh, and that's well known from combustion physics, hmm. okay? Uh, I can show you a book, the you know, North American Combustion Handbook on page 10. It will give you a table that tells you that uh, for burning of hydrocarbons in air, okay? Whereas a detonation is is different. A detonation is actually the mixture of the oxidant and the fuel together. Whether it's a solid fuel or whether it's a liquid fuel, you mix the oxidizer and the fuel together, and when you get ignition, whatever causes the ignition, the burning proceeds at close to the speed of sound in that, that condensed space. And that's what gives you sonic or supersonic velocities as that it it's, it's burning at close to the speed of sound, and it's expanding on top of that, and that gives you supersonic velocities and de detonations. That's why the thing I showed you in the beginning, you've got detonations up there, and you've got deflagrations down here, with about two or three orders of magnitude difference in time scale and pressure, okay? So it's not a small thing to say something's a detonation. It's not a... It's not just, well, we're kind of on the fence between a detonation and a deflagration. There are distinct differences, and I have done a number of failure analyses where there was an explosion, and I go and I looked at the torn metal, and I say, this was a detonation, not a deflagration, and everybody thought it was, had been a deflagration. Mm. And I later find out the people were actually, not intentionally, but they were actually making explosives. Okay. Uh, they were actually making little oxidizer pellets to put in bread. And they were putting bromate, potassium bromate, in with microcellulose. Microcellulose is the fuel. Potassium bromate is one of the strongest oxidizers on the world in the world. You mix them together in this little pellet that you're gonna the baker's gonna put in the bread. Well in the plant they're making explosives. And I wrote my report and I said this company was making explosives without a license. <laughs> they didn't even know they were making explosives. But you mix one of the strongest oxidizers with one of the with a fuel, and you've got you've got an explosive. Okay. Uh, so there's certain types of evidence when you get down to the basics of things, you have to say, hmm, there's a question here. So yeah, can I add to that? Yeah. Okay. So you show you saw the plane didn't climb, right? <coughs> we proved that. Um, you saw evidence of high speed debris, and then you also have these witnesses. And not only does the radar evidence show that there was a detonation, it shows the direction of that detonation. It just happens to coincide with the object that Major Meyer saw. He saw something going outbound. He was looking south, right? Or southwest. And he wasn't alone. A st statistically significant number of eyewitnesses uh, saw an object heading out. And, you know, they weren't, didn't have the experience that Major Meyer said. They said they saw a puff. And then they saw the plane come down. And what does radar show? Right where the plane was, high speed debris. Same direction. That's the evidence. 